Hey, 42 here. Britain is brimming with unusual customs and traditions. When we're not Morris dancing, competitively eating nettles, or snorkeling through bogs, we can sometimes be found hanging out around ancient stone circles, watching the sunrise, or chasing giant wheels of cheese down hills. But perhaps one of our most famous traditions is Guy Fawkes Night also known as Bonfire Night. Celebrated on the 5th of November, Bonfire Night sees thousands of people, including large numbers of children, turning out to watch the ritual burning of a criminal. The body of the condemned is usually prepared by local kids, many of whom will stay with the man to offer him comfort in his final hours. Though they'll all be cheering by the time the first flames start to lick at his feet. There's nothing like watching the body of a traitor slowly begin to blister and bubble as the heat rises to get a crowd going. That's what I say. Oh, hang on a minute. I've just remembered that many of my viewers don't actually come from the UK. In that case, I should probably point out that we don't burn a real criminal on bonfire night. That would be horrifying. No, we burn an effigy of the celebration's namesake, Guy Fawkes which, now I come to think of it, is also a touch disturbing. But it's definitely better than incinerating an actual human being in front of thousands of smiling onlookers and children. The reason for this probably quite strange if you weren't born here tradition is rather simple. In 1605, Guy Fawkes was caught red-handed trying to blow up the Houses of Parliament, the seat of British government. And if you ever needed proof that we British are masters of holding grudges, this should be more than enough to convince you. Every year, we burn a man's likeness to ashes for daring to mess with our monarch. Despite the fact the monarch in question, King James I, has been dead for a smidge under 400 years. But who was this mustachioed man? Why was he so hell-bent on blowing up the king? And was he really the villain that history has portrayed him to be? At the turn of the 17th century, England was a country bitterly divided by religion. On one side were the Protestants, and on the other, the Catholics. The century before had seen Henry VIII instigate the English Reformation after the Pope had denied a request to annul Henry's marriage to the first of his six wives, Catherine of Aragon. Not overly impressed with this decision, which made it rather difficult for Henry to start putting the moves on his new crush, Anne Boleyn, he set about breaking ties between the Church of England and the Vatican. From that point on, British Catholics were persecuted to some degree or other until the beginning of the 19th century. At its worst, that persecution meant imprisonment, torture, or even execution. But when King James I ascended to the throne of England in 1603, there was a great sense of optimism within the Catholic community due to his more lenient attitude towards all things Catholic. After all, his own mother, Mary Queen of Scots, was a Catholic, and nobody likes disappointing their mother, not even kings. At first, this optimism seemed to be well placed, with King James announcing he was happy for Catholics to go about their business, being all Catholicy, just so long as they behaved within the law. But the new king soon discovered his leniency was giving rise to rumours that maybe he wasn't such a devout Protestant after all. Not wanting to fall out of favour, the king did a complete U-turn on his promises and publicly announced his utter detestation of Catholicism, before promptly making it illegal to practice the religion on English soil. Whilst this move did, indeed, serve to make King James more popular with the Protestants, he had firmly positioned himself as public enemy number one in the eyes of the Catholics. The King was not a stupid man, and he knew his actions had placed an enormous target on his back. This was a time when being a king in the British Isles was a dangerous job indeed. Some 15 of James's predecessors had been either assassinated, executed, murdered, or euthanized, which frankly would be enough to make anyone a little bit paranoid. 
And that paranoia centered on one thing in particular, getting blown up. Now, that might sound like a fairly specific kind of death to be afraid of, but it turns out King James had very good reason to fear gunpowder. His own father had been murdered in the aftermath of an explosion when two barrels of black powder had been ignited underneath the building he was staying in. Fortunately for King James, he had a secret weapon in his quest to not get exploded. His chief spymaster, Robert Cecil, and the network of spies at his disposal, basically the MI5 of their day. If anyone was going to succeed in killing the king, it was going to take a plan of utmost cunning and bravery. And that's where our old friend Guy Fawkes comes in. Well, not quite. You see, despite Guy Fawkes being very much the face of the gunpowder plot today, he actually had very little to do with the planning and organising of it. The brains behind the operation was a gentleman called Robert Catesby. Catesby was a prominent Catholic recusant who had a bitter history with the English monarchy. Under the rule of Elizabeth, his father had been imprisoned on account of his faith. Catesby himself had also spent time behind bars for his involvement in a rebellion against the Queen. When King James had taken to the throne, Catesby had shown little faith in the King's promises and had already begun plotting devastating ways to end the Protestant rule in England forever. But to realise his ambition, Catesby would need help, and so he assembled a crack team of trusted associates. This group of Catholic zealots consisted of Thomas Percy, John Wright, Thomas Winter, and Guy Fawkes. Unlike the others, who were men of considerable stature and well-known in London, Guy Fawkes was a bit of an enigma. He was a hardened military man, said to be highly skilled in matters of war. He'd recently returned from overseas where he'd been fighting for the Spanish in the Eighty Years' War. Not for its entirety, I hasten to add. His relative anonymity was an attractive prospect for Catesby, who needed someone who wouldn't raise suspicions whilst doing the dirty work for what would become known as the Gunpowder Plot. The five conspirators met at the place where all great plans are made. The local pub. The Duck and Drake Inn, to be precise. It was here that Catesby first put forward his idea to blow up the Houses of Parliament, using as many barrels of gunpowder as the conspirators could lay their hands on. But the plot itself was a little more complicated than just lighting a fuse and running away as fast as possible. Catesby wanted the plan to be executed during the state opening of Parliament, a grand ceremony that officially marks the beginning of the parliamentary year. Incidentally, the ceremony still takes place to this day, and it opens with a thorough search of the cellars beneath the Houses of Parliament, for reasons that will soon become very clear. Most importantly, it was a time and place when not only the king, but also his lords and dignitaries would all be congregated inside the same building. One fatal blow would be enough to bring Protestant England crashing to its knees. But Catesby's plan didn't stop there. During the ensuing chaos, the plotters would kidnap the king's nine-year-old daughter, Elizabeth, from her home in Coombe Abbey. The kidnapped princess would be placed on the throne as a puppet queen. She wouldn't have any real power, which would leave the Catholic rebels free to begin orchestrating another major religious reform, this time in their favour. Despite the terrifying consequences they faced should the plan go wrong, Thomas Percy, John Wright, Thomas Winter and Guy Fawkes all agreed to join Catesby in his attempt to overthrow the king. But making plans to bring down the monarchy whilst drinking a pint in your local was one thing. Actually putting those plans into practice was going to be another entirely. Catesby was a well-connected man with his finger in many pies. And although gunpowder supplies were regulated by the government, there were plenty of people willing to bend the law for the right price. But the plotters knew a single barrel wouldn't be enough for what they had in mind. 
and so 36 powder kegs were procured, all told around 2,500 kilograms of gunpowder, more than enough to realise their destructive intentions. The next challenge was to get these conspicuous barrels into position beneath the Palace of Westminster, a task that would surely be next to impossible. Actually, not so much. After initially making plans to dig a tunnel beneath the building, Thomas Percy saved them all the hassle by simply leasing a cellar directly below the House of Lords, the very room where the opening of Parliament was scheduled to take place. With the barrels in position, all the plotters had to do was sit tight and wait for the opening of Parliament to begin. The ceremony was originally scheduled to take place in May, but due to an imminent threat of plague, it had to be postponed until the 5th of November. Sounds familiar. But it was an awfully long time for our plotters to sit and stew, with the knowledge that their explosive plans could be discovered at any moment. Quite understandably, several of the conspirators, whose ranks had grown to include 13 people by now, were getting a little twitchy. On the off chance the cellar was searched by government officials, Guy Fawkes had hidden the barrels of gunpowder beneath bundles of firewood. But it wasn't just a plot being discovered that was a cause for concern. Some of the plotters were beginning to worry they would be damned by God as a result of their actions. After all, everyone knows thou shalt not kill hundreds of innocent people with gunpowder. It's pretty much Christianity 101. Some of the conspirators even had friends amongst the intended victims. But Catesby was unswerving. As far as he was concerned, if they wanted to bring down the monarchy and an entire religion with it, their powder kegs were going to have to break a few eggs along the way. But eggs turned out to be the right word, because one of the plotters was about to crack. On the evening of the 26th of October, William Parker, 4th Baron Monteagle to give him his full, rather modest title, was settling down for his supper, when one of his servants handed him a letter that had apparently just been delivered by a shadowy figure who had since disappeared into the night. The Baron was one of the elite few who was scheduled to attend the opening of Parliament the following month. And so, from his perspective, the contents of the letter were particularly startling. My Lord, out of the love I bear to some of your friends, I have a care of your preservation. Therefore, I would advise you, as you tender your life, to devise some excuse to shift your attendance at this Parliament. The letter will go on to warn that anyone who attended the ceremony would receive a terrible blow. Parker didn't hesitate. He rode to Westminster, where he handed the letter over to the spymaster, Robert Cecil, who, in turn, showed it to the king. King James pored over the content of the letter meticulously. The words, terrible blow, caught his attention. To him, this could mean only one thing, gunpowder. It was the beginning of the end for our conspirators. On the 4th of November, the King ordered that the buildings in and around Parliament be searched. And when his men searched the plotter's undercroft, they found Guy Fawkes standing beside the hidden barrels of gunpowder. Now you could have forgiven poor old Guy for falling to his knees and crying like a baby at this point, but Fawkes was made of sterner stuff. He remained composed and calmly explained that the cellar belonged to his master, Thomas Percy, and he was merely a servant going about his daily routine. The search party left, with Fawkes feeling certain they'd bought the lie, but in fact, he'd made a fatal error. By name-dropping fellow conspirator Thomas Percy, a known Catholic with a rebellious past, he'd raised even more suspicion. Later that night, the search party returned to question Guy Fawkes further. This time, Fawkes told them his name was John Johnson. Not convinced by quite possibly one of the laziest fake names ever given, they proceeded to search him, and in his pockets, they found long matches, commonly used to ignite barrels of gunpowder. Guy Fawkes was immediately arrested, and with that, 
his fate was sealed. After his arrest, a more thorough search of the Undercroft was conducted, and the barrels of gunpowder were discovered. The news quickly spread throughout London, and soon reached the other plotters, most of whom promptly soiled themselves. But one man whose underwear remained resolutely pristine despite the dire circumstances was Catesby. He gathered what men he could and rode out of London, heading for Warwick Castle. There, they raided the castle's stores for gunpowder and muskets before desperately trying to raise support from their fellow Catholics without much luck. Dejected, the plotters holed up in a safe house. There, they decided that, despite the plot's failure, they weren't going to go out without a fight. Unfortunately, the gunpowder they'd stolen from Warwick Castle had gotten damp during the raid, rendering it useless. That is, unless they could somehow dry it out. British weather being what it is, laying the gunpowder out to dry in the sun wasn't an option. And so, in their desperation, the men placed the powder in front of an open fire. But yeah, if there was a list of things not to put in front of an open fire, gunpowder would probably rank pretty high up. All it took was a single spark, and in seconds a huge fireball had engulfed four of the men, including Catesby, leaving them with terrible injuries. The men took the accident as an omen that their plight was doomed, which had been pretty obvious for quite some time, if you ask me. And it turned out they were exactly right. The following morning, 200 of the King's men besieged the safe house and opened fire. Robert Catesby was shot and killed. In his hand, he was clutching a picture of the Virgin Mary. Of the four plotters who'd met that fateful day in the Duck and Drake Inn, all but Thomas Winter were shot and killed. He, along with the other survivors, were taken back to the capital to join Guy Fawkes in the Tower of London where they would face an even more terrifying fate. Immediately after his arrest, Fawkes was questioned, but refused to incriminate any of his fellow plotters, insisting he'd been working alone. When asked why he'd been discovered hanging around with a load of gunpowder, he demonstrated an admiral streak of badassery by replying that he intended to blow you Scotch beggars back to your native mountains in reference to the King's Scottish heritage. His fearlessness earned him a degree of respect from the King, but that respect engendered no mercy. Guy Fawkes was subjected to two days of unimaginable torture before he finally broke down and confessed the details of the plot. In all, eight plotters were tried for high treason and sentenced to be hanged, drawn and quartered, which was about as pleasant as it sounds involving being drawn to the execution by a horse, a brief but non-fatal hanging, the cutting off of the prisoner's genitals, and the removal of their intestines through a small incision in their stomach. Finally, they were decapitated and quartered, literally cut up into four pieces, with each piece being sent to a different part of the country, where it would be put on display as a reminder to all that it's probably not the best idea to mess with the king. On the 31st of January, 1606, Guy Fawkes was taken from the Tower of London to face this barbaric fate at the Old Palace Yard, situated in Westminster, directly opposite the very building he'd hoped to blow up. But in one last act of defiance, he was able to launch himself from the hangman's scaffold, breaking his own neck in the process and sparing himself the agony of the planned execution. Thomas Winter would not be so lucky. To this day, the author of the infamous Monteagle letter, the one that unraveled the whole plot, remains unknown. Some believe it was Francis Tresham, a late addition to the plot who was known to have associates attending the opening of Parliament. Some people have even speculated that the Baron Monteagle himself wrote the letter, hoping to curry favour with the King. Intriguingly, some modern historians believe that Robert Cecil knew of the plot long before the letter was delivered. Some even speculate he might have aided the plot's development, allowing the oblivious plotters to acquire the Undercroft 
and obtain the gunpowder with relative ease. Even if he'd known about Catesby's intentions, it would certainly have been in Cecil's best interest to allow the plot to develop for as long as possible, knowing that the longer it appeared to remain a secret, the more Catholic zealots would incriminate themselves by getting involved. How much Cecil knew of the plot can never be known for sure, but it's clear that its failure greatly benefited the king and the Protestant cause. The gunpowder plot was used to vilify Catholics up and down the country, and new stricter laws were put in place, preventing Catholics from voting, practicing law, or serving as officers in the army or navy. To deter any future attempts to blow up Parliament, it was important that the events of the gunpowder plot were never forgotten. And so, in 1606, the observance of the 5th of November Act was passed. This act called for an annual thanksgiving for the failure of the plot, and it's the reason that once a year in England, you might find yourself standing in a muddy field, breaking your teeth on an overpriced toffee apple, whilst an effigy of a man in a big silly hat is ceremoniously incinerated on a huge fire. These days, Guy Fawkes has become something of a cult hero, a man who once stood up for what he believed in and showed great bravery in the face of a terrible fate. Even if you knew nothing about the gunpowder plot before this video, there's a good chance you've come across Guy's mugshot before. A mask depicting his likeness was used heavily in the film V for Vendetta, and it's since become a powerful symbol for those protesting against the establishment, most notably through the hacktivist group Anonymous. Whether you see Guy Fawkes as a hero or not, one notable English professor once described him as the last man to enter Parliament with honest intentions. Or if you see him as a villain who attempted to end the lives of hundreds of people, nobody can argue that he's achieved a level of fame that few in history can match. Though, admittedly, that has come at the price of getting ritually burnt alive tens of thousands of times every year for four centuries. You win some, you lose some. Thanks for watching. Check out my new podcast, Random Interesting Facts, available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Link in the description below. Thanks.